Good afternoon. You've made it to the second to last paper, so thank you very much for staying and being here and for inviting me. Uh, you'll notice I am not Della Scott Ireton, who is featured in the preliminary program. She has had some surgery this uh, just a few weeks ago, so she's recovering. And I said, Della, send me a picture so I can show all the people what you look like. And she said, I will put whatever you want up. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Della, the beautiful Della, and do uh, have her come uh, next year because she's got wonderful, intelligent things to say about maritime archaeology. I'm a terrestrial archaeologist who studies, uh, specializes in historic cemeteries and uh, community engagement and landscapes and um, uh, 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 plantation era sites. Uh, the foreshore is a little bit new to me, so I got to go, thanks to Elliot and his crew, do a little foreshore walk on Thursday, so I got to stand up during the initial rounds of who had been on one of the walking tours, but it was a real uh, pleasure and a real insight into what we can uh, take. Like Luke said, I am also a spy among you, taking a lot of things uh, ready to go home. Uh, so I also heard you guys have this acronym JAR, and since I leave tomorrow, I have lots and lots of change to dump into the JAR before I leave. But I wanted to frame the first part of the talk around different training workshops we do with the public to help uh, do our work at FPAN, and there are lots of acronyms. So it's uh, organized in a way to help you through that. Uh, all the C and logo soup at the bottom, and then at the bottom I threw in a few like what's coming next, what might Della come and talk about next year, and also some developments we've had even since I uh, left for England, which was not very long ago. So the first acronym, shining a light, uh, sunshine, up to FPAN. Oop, yep, there you go, the three P to get the acronyms um, demystified. FPAN in a nutshell exact, exists to help protect the state's buried past through education and outreach. But I do think in 12 years that FPAN has existed, the threats have changed quite a bit. So you'll see that in our training programs. We might have been identifying one threat at one time, but 12 years later, it's come to include a gamut of different kinds of threats. So we do education and outreach, we assist local governments, and we also assist our divisions of historical resources. So FPAN is very unique. I don't think many education and outreach uh, units in the states have this assisting local government component, but I think it makes our programs better and more relevant and also more sustainable, and we have a, a broader reach of partners that we can involve. We are not the only PAN. We now have TexPAN in Texas that just started, uh, OakPAN in Oklahoma, and maybe a month ago was announced we have UPAN, Utah PAN. So we're starting to see more of these public archaeology networks booming out in other states. Uh, FPAN is a large organization. We cover the whole state, maybe a little like Citizen that divides up into different offices. We have eight. Um, I'm the director of both the Northeast and the East Central. Della's way over here in the North Central area. And there's about 20 full-time staff that work for FPAN that have wide variety of specializations. So if there's something I don't know, it's great because I have a colleague I can call on who does just that. These are some of our numbers from one year of annual reports. We do about 1,800 events annually. That can be talking to kids, that could be doing workshops, that could be doing presentations, putting movies online. And we have about 83,000 individuals that come to our program each year. And we are active in all 67 counties across Florida. So our next acronym to shine a light on is the Heritage Awareness Diving Seminar. Della didn't include this in the abstract, maybe because she's the creator of HADS, and HADS is her baby. So rather than me butcher what HADS is all about, I'm going to show you a short video in her own words.
always the tricky part. There we go. Uh, so has is focused, um, the audience for this is dive instructors. So as divers are getting certified, they get that information early to leave artifacts in place, to enjoy the historic environment, but to do no harm. Uh, one good case study that m melds with one of our other programs later is the brick wreck, because they've been diving on the brick wreck, doing monitoring through HADS program for at least 12 years now. The wreck used to be covered in bricks, um, and now I think they're down to one final brick left on that entire wreck. There are bricks in restaurants that are nearby, bricks in houses all over the community, but uh, they did not get the message fast enough, so it's a good case study where we take divers to show not only are the bricks totally depleted, so is the environment. It's one of the worst dives you can do compared to other ones that have the site intact. The environment is uh, more thriving, more beautiful, and it's better for the dive operators as well because people want to go on those other dives. So how did this happen uh, in prevent, preventing disturbance of the shipwrecks? Forgetting that remote doesn't work. Um, the next program I just wanted to touch on briefly is SEAS. That's Submerged Sites Education and Archaeological Stewardship. And this, rather than uh, the audience are dive instructors, the audience for this are sport divers, trying to get divers trained. Uh, some of the coursework is similar to HADS. They go over the laws, they go over artifacts, they go over um, 101 basics of underwater archeology. span But in this course, they are very interested in assigning targets to the students who graduate, having them go out and see what the sites look like at that point in time and then reporting back to the state. Uh, and for more information on those, Della has conveniently co-authored an edited volume uh, Between the Devil and the Deep, and that features more on the uh, HADS and the SEAS programs. Um, we're moving over to cemetery resource protection training, and Crypt is my baby, so. Uh, but I think it does help tell the story of these different training workshops and how they developed over time. Uh, before I worked for the Florida Public Archaeology Network, I came from Kentucky, where I did not specialize in doing human burial, uh, human remains, excavation. But once I started doing it as part of my work, the phone never stopped. And I felt like that's what I ended up doing for the rest of the five years I was there. So this is a Mexican War veteran who's buried six feet under in a cast iron casket that predates the patents for it. So lots of information we learned there. Um, jumping over, this is one of my final cemeteries I worked on in Kentucky. We had to move over 600 people in six weeks time. So you can imagine, I started thinking, huh, what could we do so that we didn't have to do this and start removing all the people all the time? I'd much rather people come visit his human burial sites where it's clean and safe and uh, interpreted for the public. So we launched our cemetery resource protection training workshops. Uh, they're coming up on maybe eight years old and we've done 78 workshops now across Florida. So it's a very popular topic in Florida. A lot of people are taphophiles or cemeterians and they like to go out and visit them. I spend a bit of time at Highgate myself enjoying your cemeteries. Uh, but we do have now just short of a thousand graduates of the CRIP program. Um, widespread across Florida, and there's actually three conferences, not two conferences, that we've done. But this is, you know, citizen science uh, 101 for us of how to get the community, uh, increase their scientific literacy on what's happening with these cemeteries and then get them out there. I was thinking on the foreshore, or yesterday somebody said we do the cleaning and the documenting. I thought, we don't do much cleaning on the on the shore ourselves, but we do do a lot of cleaning out in the cemeteries and recording as well. Crypt has four morning components. This is actually the icebreaker. Imagine if you guys had walked in here and I said, draw your final resting place. <laughs> People resist it, staff resist it, but I feel it's really important to drill down as many times as you can that cemeteries are about populations, and not individuals. And also, it's fair game. We're going to be talking about other people's final resting place. We should consider uh, the respect that we would want for our own 
And also these people never got together and decided what their management strategy would be. So we're doing our best to try uh, and address some of the issues in uh, for cemeteries in Florida. So our first presentation really emphasizes the importance of having a cemetery management plan. We have a lot of flash in the pan cleanup days, and those are great, but you know, I'm not thinking, what can we do to make this look prettier? I'm thinking like an archeologist, what can we do to make this place stay here for another 100 years? So getting a cemetery management plan is very critical and getting friends organizations starting. So that's the first presentation. Then we talk about human burial laws and the burial laws in every state in the US is very different state by state. So we review quickly the federal laws, get into state laws and then get into the tricky parts of when you're on either private land or abandoned land. Uh, we have our Florida master site file very important to get sites listed on there when developers, when anyone doing work, uh, they have to look at the maps and clear within a two kilometer radius, I believe, that they, or demonstrate that they won't have an impact on cultural resources. So it's very important to get the cemeteries listed, get that dot on the map, and you're gonna see lots of dots in a little bit. It's only a two page form and the instructions are 40 pages. So maybe <laughs> it's good we have our workshop to try and help people along uh, on how to fill those out. A slide like this starts to make people very angry like in Clay County because the Clay County has at least 80 cemeteries if you're driving around and you can see them everywhere. They're in the neighborhoods, but this is all that's listed on the Florida master site file. And that's really the number one thing you can do to protect a cemetery from development. So we have data gaps. I'll cut it short, but no, we have data gaps to the tune of 8,000 cemeteries in Florida alone that are not listed. So we cannot manage what we haven't identified, right? So we really need the public's help in getting out and filling out that two-page form. Let us know where those cemeteries are located. Then we go out in the afternoon, everyone's favorite part and the cleaning. We use a D2 biocide solution and I don't think that's very common over here, but it is um, uh, non-toxic. It works for about three to five years to protect the stone and you clean the stone that day, but the B D2 gets absorbed further in. So you won't really see the final result for a month and then it's really striking because some of these headstones won't get visited like ever again. So might as well give it the best chance you can. This is in Clay County. We're doing this workshop on February 16th. And I know that because we're cleaning the headstone. I've turned my back and everyone burst out into happy birthday. Kind of like yesterday with our happy birthday, but I thought it's not my birthday. And it was uh, Happy Forrester's birthday, and she was the first free black woman in Clay County. So that we were out there by mistake, <laughs> uh, by coincidence anyway, and then had selected her headstone. It was a really nice, uh, nice day. So we have people who are from the city of Jacksonville, their preservation office. We have retired teachers who are out there helping us do their work, and the press when they're able to come out and share the word of what we're doing. If you're interested in hearing more about Crypt, I did this article in Advances in Archaeological Practice. Not all their articles are free to view, but this volume is free to view. And it was our idea to give the blueprint. I can't go to every state. I would like to go to all the states, but this way other states can steal it and do it for them as well. Uh, I really don't have time for this, but I just have to say, in identifying what the different threats are. It's not always development. So we have institutionalized racism um, that turns its head, especially in the cemeteries. It's such a difference for us because a lot of cemeteries we work in, they are the first um, populations after emancipation. They are the populations during the Jim Crow era. So the inequality that we see in cemeteries, it's not just neglect of 2018, we're talking some deep, deep seated issues. So uh, we believe very much that we do our job to help end racism and working in the cemeteries is one example of that. And I think that's why uh, the program has drawn so many people. They're doing a little more for social justice than just cleaning the headstones. Uh, this also shows the complexity of the problem when you clean a cemetery up so well that a new burial is found. <laughs> You're like, oh, wait a minute, cemeteries close, it's full. How is there another burial? 
Well, this burial gets put in for a couple hundred dollars cash uh, at a abandoned African-American cemetery. Just over that fence line, if you were to be buried there and cremated and in a box is about $7,000. So if we start shutting down this kind of behavior, then where are the bodies going to go? So that just gives you a taste of the complexity surrounding our burials. But the work in the cemeteries led us to, and I'm very sorry, I'm not used to talking to an audience where HMS means something totally different. I mean, no disrespect. And there were four HMS Florida ships. So thank you, Maritimers. I can uh, take that comment later. But for us, uh, it's our acronym for Heritage Monitoring Scouts of Florida. I realize there will never be at HMS um, London, but I, Anyway, to explain what that acronym is. So we got into Heritage Monitoring Scouts initially from the cemeteries. This shows the threats of the cemeteries. And remember, there's about 1,200 that are listed on the site file. So maybe 170 cemeteries are safe. But there's lots of different definitions of threat levels for the cemeteries. And one of them is sea level rise and storm surge. And we had our first planner, remember local governments? up in Fernandina and said, Sarah, I have to do a cemetery management plan for a cemetery that looks like it's gonna be impacted by sea level rise. What should I do? And it was really the first time I looked into, well, what is gonna happen? Um, we expanded our view beyond cemeteries and found, wow, beyond cemeteries, we're talking about a lot of archeological sites, about 4,000 that are gonna get impacted with a, a six foot rise. And that doesn't even include the structures and the other resources that we have around the state. Uh, I can tell you one stat that the sea level is rising 20% rising faster in Florida than the global average because my son was featured in this exhibit panel that has that statistic up top. So thanks to the University of Florida for including our story about how the, the turtles with the sea level rise are in fact, they're impacted because of the renourishment of the beaches. And they bring in tons, tons and tons of sand to renourish the beaches and it disturbs uh, the animals as well as the cultural resources. Uh, to get a little more awareness of sea level rise in Florida, I read this book and here's my cliff notes there. Similar to what we heard earlier, this misconception of a fixed sea level, and we definitely do not have that in Florida, so we have it in flux. Uh, and this is another favorite. It's bizarre to me that we have climate change deniers in Florida, but this quote gets me pretty far with them. We already have a stressed coastal situation. That usually ends the discussion as far as what conflict we may have in approaching this problem. Because there's no doubt, if you're looking at the news in Florida right now, we have a very overly stressed coastal situation. And sea level rise isn't just about the inundation. This is one of our oldest historic sites in the state of Florida. This is the Fountain of Views 1565 landing site of Pedro Menendez. And they put um, the coastal defense up on the side. So that water is actually trapped in there by their defense that they installed. So we have things not just being impacted by the sea level rise and the storm surge, but by our own engineering efforts to battle the sea level rise and the storm surge. Uh, this was after Hurricane Ermine, which was a very minor storm. This is on the other side of the state, but I wanted to throw in a shell mound uh, image for you. So this, Jeff is pointing to the impact line on this mound at Crystal River just from her mind, and she was a one. So imagine with um, Michael, who's a four now, it might have topped up to the top of the mound. And it's not just our historic sites and our prehistoric sites, our submerged sites are also uh, threatened and endangered, and I'll return to that hopefully in a few minutes. Uh, we have some tools though. This shows my town, St. Augustine, and my office is right around there. The white areas are normally above water, but I clicked on the viewer for a six foot rise and you can see all the areas. So Florida has definitely got um, some gondolas in its future. <laughs> this is our storm surge map. So I thought I laser focus on sea level rise. I wasn't really thinking about the storm surge. We have Hurricane Matthew come through, which was a category two. Everything in orange flooded. Everything in orange flooded 
my three flat, my three F pen cards were parked right here. I had this map. Had I only used it and been aware, uh, we could have maybe saved those vehicles. Uh, and another interesting comment: these cemeteries beyond there, beyond the storm surge, they were the most impacted by the hurricane. We have some other viewers, but I'm going to skip ahead in favor of showing you a few other things. Uh, really, only the National Park System has a plan in place. For most of the rest of the sites in Florida, abandonment in place is the action that will be taken. So this is a bummer. <coughs> this is a time to deploy the kittens. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like Stephanie said, if you're not having fun, we can't, we can't proceed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we did want to see a brighter light in our future and we look to scape, we look to citizen, we stole all your stuff, right? And thought, what could we do that would make it fun and get people out there? Because people don't want to just stand by and watch this all happen. So we designed the Heritage Monitor Scout program um, and with this engagement pyramid in mind of how to involve people at different levels and how to get the message out there of who would be our scouts, who would be out and doing this work. So we have retired teachers, mother, daughter, there's my husband who's a former archeologist. Um, we have retired park service members. We ask them to fill out this form um, and you guys get the point of monitoring so we don't have to go into what that is. But that shows one of the cuts that was made overnight during Matthew. We do try and get out to the cemeteries. This is what 1,200 cemeteries on a map looks like. And we do a annual call cemetery dash to try and get as many visited as possible. And we have other threats, right? So neo-Nazism up on the rise. We put this out to our scouts. Please keep an eye on these historic Jewish cemeteries. If there's any issue, any vandalism, we want to know about it right away. So I will just end with just showing you um, some images of our sites that were impacted during Matthew and then Irma. <laughs> so this is a historic well that was there forever and ever that I've been there. This is after Matthew and then again after Irma and that's on our side. So uh, people who have been to the site say I don't do a very good job in explaining like how much <laughs> has been taken away. So this is the best I can do to show you. We used to take tours out there to stand and talk around the well. And now that's what the well looks like today. Uh, we do have 864 reports in and 432 scouts engaged at different levels. We have a conference where we try and get people uh, to get to advanced topics beyond just their initial training. And then next year, have Della come and talk about our submerged HMS. This is a cheat from our EAA paper that was just in September. And it's really the very first we've done of submerged site monitoring with this purpose in mind because our shipwrecks are also changing quite a bit uh, and have other factors that we weren't thinking about 12 years ago. So uh, HMS Scouts, good and good for you. We want people out there having fun, enjoying themselves, but helping do good. And that was the end of my talk until right, Michael hit. And I just got these pictures overnight. So we're getting ready to deploy and use from 3D scanning and use the drone to start recording shipwrecks like this. And same thing, they show up, um, but they're gone within a couple of days or they get buried again by um, the sand before we can get So thank you very much. Thank you.